Okay, thank you. I would like to thank the organizing committee to invite me here. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure also to be uh, here uh, representing as a kit. I'm a board a member of a kit. I'm a transplant surgeon and uh, I'm going to discuss the non HLA antibodies in kidney transplantation. This is most likely the first slide for all presenters who's going to talk about uh, antibody mediated rejection. Because right now we are good at having the first real success, but uh, whatever we did, we are not very successful in achieving better long-term graft survival. And antibody-mediated rejection is a most important factor that will help us to improve it. So, um, as before, we had uh, initially the CDC cross matches to win the humoral rejection. Then we start to do full cytometry. We learned about the different cell types and uh, different reactions. It was a very important step to have the solid phase B, uh, single B studies that we achieved to know the all HLA antibodies in a recipient. Uh, that enabled us to do virtual cross match and progress more. But still, there's something missing. And uh, it was realized back in 1989 when they first find that a, a identical twin transplanted uh, had rejection. So it's not HLA, they're HLA identical. So there's a problem with other uh, non-HLA antigens. And further studies uh, from a collaborative study of Opel's just also brought out that the non-HLA antibodies are an important factor. Several different studies showed that uh, there are different non-HLA antibodies in kidney transplantation, and it's not only in kidney, also heart, lung, and liver has important uh, non-HLA antibodies. From those, uh, we all know uh, the MICA, the Major Histocompatibility Complex Class I chain related molecule A, and uh, the most uh, important one maybe is the angiotensin II type 1 receptor antibodies, and IECA and Tiperlecan, and this is another important one that uh, the uh, laminin-like globular subdomain tree is an important uh, antibody that's evaluated right now. We mentioned, as you see, these are the non-HLA antibodies that's especially uh, concerned in kidney transplantation, but there are several more, actually. Uh, I want to discuss something else. When we just do a kidney transplantation, the first thing is the vascular endothelium. That's the first barrier between the immune system and uh, the graft. And uh, the endothelium has various ALO and OTO antibodies. And uh, therefore, these cells play an important role in pathogenesis of antibody-mediated rejection. But in contrast to HLA, which is presented you know, outside of the cell and it's right there, these antibodies are actually deeper in structure and it's especially a tissue damage is very important to bring them out and uh, to initiate an autoantibody response or maybe with persistent impulse cause an enhancing in inflammation. From those uh, we all discussed about, we know about the uh, alloantibodies HLA and ABO. Uh, Mika is another antibody that's an alloantibody, but the rest of them are autoantibodies. Uh, as we discussed just recently, the angiotensin 1 receptor, abimantin, perlecan, and these are all uh, autoantibodies. So we should just realize that when we do a kidney transplant or any other organ transplant, the sole issue is not the HLA uh, antigens. Uh, so we should also see there is alloimmunity, autoimmunity, and tissue injury. This is a triad, and it can form a cascade and make the reaction more and more. Uh, after performing the transplantation, you can have uh, acute rejection and tissue damage. 
or before you do the transplant, a cadaveric kidney can wait for a long time. Or during surgery, you can have problem, you can put the kidney in and then bring out back. So it seems it's, the vision is to see that this is the combination of all that causes the long-term problems. And this is also what uh, Anil mentioned yesterday during his presentation, that uh, when there is delayed graft function, uh, the rejection, the acute rejection is much frequent uh, at that patient's course. So here is uh, actually what we've been mentioning. For example, in this figure one, the kidney, let me show you here. So you have a kidney transplantation and the ischemic perfusion injury and also the autoantibodies can cause uh, autoantigen exposure and this can cause complement activation and a severe vascular rejection. So they are coming actually together, the ischemic perfusion, alloimmune attack, and autoantibodies. And also, even in native kidneys, when you have ischemia and when you have microvascular, how does this work? In the figure two, when you have microvascular damage, this can go to enhanced microvascular damage and can be a fibrosis, issue or can be an acute kidney injury or delayed graft function in the patient. So talking about uh, LG3 subdomain, perlican is an important non-HLA antibody. Uh, and uh, it has, uh, especially this is laminin-like globular domain 3, is the most anti-angiogenic uh, activity part. And studies have shown that when, does this work? Okay. And studies have shown that uh, when you have high levels of LG3, the rejection is more likely to be in vascular rejection, so the bump rate is getting higher. And also, there are some studies showing that uh, the rejection with uh, the uh, LG3 levels are high in patients who has uh, vascular rejection compared to the ones who doesn't have any rejection. And also, these antibodies are showing an increase during the time of acute rejection. And uh, clinical studies have shown that, especially when they are presenting with uh, DSA, at that time, uh, they have a synergetic et effect and the one year graph survival is significantly influenced. Pimentin is another one. This one uh, is actually more active in cells of mesenchymal origin. And uh, there are some studies showing that uh, it can uh, present with interstitial fibrosis or tubular atrophy of kidney after transplantation. Eter is an other one. It's mainly concerned in heart transplantation, but there are some clinical studies showing that it may have some impact on kidney transplantation. Well, talking about MICA, this is a famous one and uh, most well-known one. Uh, and MICA is uh, the major histocompatibility complex class one chain related to molecule A. And uh, it's expressed on endothelial cells, monocytes, dendritic cells, fibroblasts, and epithelial cells. It's just like how you get sensitized to HLA, you can get sensitized to MICA as well. And uh, in uh, renal transplant recipients, 9% to 27% of patients have MICA antibodies. But most of the studies have shown that uh, the direct clinical correlation between MICA antibodies and the clinical outcome is not very clear. So still, there should be some more evaluation to figure out the effect of MICA. But here's maybe the most important one, and uh, the angiotensin II type 1 receptor. Uh, this is uh, the receptor that's uh, working for the blood pressure regulation. Uh, and the data shows that the pretransplant detection of 
uh, angiotensin II type 1 receptor is an independent risk factor for development of microvascular inflammation. So there are several studies. These are all uh, studies, but I, I picked one of those that's more recent. So in the study, uh, it shows that the uh, AT1R has important effect in uh, kidney outcome, especially when it has combined with HLA DSA. So if you have both HLA antibodies and if you have angiotensin AT1R antibodies, then it has clinically significant effect. Uh, more of it, the uh, rejection caused by AT1R is uh, not C40 positive. It's not through the complement activation system. So you see that uh, it's, uh, in these cases, you see uh, uh, acute humoral rejection, but it's not C40 positive. So in this study, it shows that when you have, uh, and antimica antibodies, they did not show any significance in the study, but the uh, multivariate analysis shows that anti-AT1R antibodies are important, and especially when we talk about the pretransplant risk factor for allograft failure, it's especially more important, and it has synergetic effect with HLA DSA. Also, this is another paper showing that the serum levels of uh, AT1R antibodies are increasing during the time of rejection. And this is another study that when you have uh, high levels of AT1R antibodies, then this is a risk factor, an independent risk factor for the HLA DSA detection. detection. So it seems uh, we are talking about L antibodies, autoantibodies, and tissue damage all together. So at the end, I think this is important because in literature there are so many uh, publications, but they are mostly uh, retrospective, and uh, there's no enough database about uh, definitely proving which is significant clinically. Uh, the most wise thing is actually this is done by a group of uh, physicians from Europe. Just like we screen the uh, PRA, we should be able to screen the patients for uh, non-HLA antibodies. So they have uh, just checked the whole possible non-HLA antibodies mentioned in literature, and it's important to arrange an assay to detect the uh, anti-HLA antibodies. This way maybe we can find uh, which anti-HLA antibody is significantly important, and we can speak just like how we discuss about single beat assays, and right now we come to a level a consensus in HLA antigens, we can maybe come to a uh, consensus in, the, in these. So as a result, uh, well, we shouldn't forget that we have non-HLA antibodies and uh, we should uh, always consider the alloy immunity while we're talking about HLAs and tissue damage is an important part of it. From all these uh, non-HLA antibodies, the uh, antiperlocan LG3 antibodies and angiotensin II type 1 receptor antibodies are the most important ones, and there are some important clinical data showing that they, have, they may have uh, significance in graft outcome. Another important thing is uh, sometimes you may have uh, humoral rejection to non-HLA uh, antibodies, even if you don't have any C4D deposition, so clinically Sometimes it can be really challenging. And uh, right now there is no definite evidence to say that you should do screen for non-HLA antibodies, but uh, I hope it's pending. Thank you very much.